Hello everyone, my name is uh, Anthony Corns, I'm uh, the Technology Manager at the Discovery Programme which is a, a centre for Irish, Irish Archaeological Research based in Dublin. And today uh, my the uh, title of my talk uh, is uh, From Long Light to Laser Light, so it's, it's looking at uh, different approaches to how heritage was recorded over the past 200 years and then trying to make this resource available online to a wider community. So this is also the work of Louise Kennedy from the Discovery Programme. So uh, I'm just going to kind of introduce you to a couple of characters in terms of uh, people who recorded uh, cultural heritage in Ireland. So the first is uh, George Victor de Noye. So during the 1800s, uh, George uh, worked for de Noye, as most people would call him. Uh, he worked for the Ordnance Survey from the UK as a surveyor within Ireland. So he travelled around the country and then he, he subsequently worked as the geolo in, within the Geological Survey of Ireland. But he was more interested, so his primary role was uh, mapping and recording, but he was also a great artist and a painter. So as he was on his travels recording and recording the, the actual physical features, he would also record things like geology, natural wildlife, uh, plants, but also the heritage features. So example here, the Yale Church, this was done in 1851, and these are kind of, they're regarded as some of the kind of best uh, records of the heritage monuments uh, of the time. Here's another two examples. So the, the one on the the left is uh, Kilmacada uh, sundial. So this is a medieval uh, decorated stone, and the one on the right is is Lock Crew, which is a megalithic rock art. And again, he's the kind of he's got a very kind of uh, graphical kind of approach to recording things and, and capturing that kind of detail. So. He, if somebody did one of these now, they would be a very similar style to what the contemporary archaeologists would do. If we skip forwards, uh, probably about another 50 years, uh, the Dr. Ephraim McDowell Cosgrave. Uh, so this guy was a uh, he was president of the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland, and he was also a president of the Amateur Photography Society in Ireland. So this is again, it's somebody who's it's not their primary <coughs> role but they've decided to uh, take an interest in, in cultural heritage. So because he was a, a photographer, he used to capture kind of the earliest scenes in, in, in Ireland of just everyday life. So here you can see uh, the, the, on the right, the Dublin tenement slums, and on the left, that guy's obviously had a hard day collecting cabbages, or he's had a hard day on the drink. I don't know which one it is. So. But this guy would capture life but he was also, due to, uh, serendipitously, also the founder of the Georgian Society in Ireland and also a member of the Royal Society of Antiquities in Ireland. So, as part of the Royal Society, he would uh, take photographs of uh, famous landmarks, they would have field trips and he would be the official photographer. So, here's Carrickfergus Cas Carrick Castle. And also, it, it's, it, when he recorded a lot of these buildings, they were, they were probably recorded before there was any uh, large-scale repairs being done on them by the Office of Public Works at that stage, so we kind of get a better idea of what, what the true uh, shape of these buildings were. Here's an example as well of uh, the, uh, the High Cross in Carandona, and you can see the one on the uh, the left there, or sorry, on the right, this is the, the High Cross on Devonish. This is one of the field trips where the, the, the guys in the dapper suits and the top hats are out for the day. Slightly different than the, the, the Berghaus jackets we work today. If we skip again forwards, uh, 60 or 70 years, uh, we're still looking at photography, but now we're, we're going into more into the modern age, so it's this guy here is called Leo Swan. And again, a serendipitous moment, this uh, Leo was a, a pilot with the, what's called the US Flying Tigers during the Cold War. He was born in, in Ireland, but then he came, came back to Ireland and, and got involved with archaeology, so he was kind of one of the pioneers in the in the 60s and 70s of actually capturing the uh, aerial photography of of, uh, of sites and monuments around Ireland. So a couple of examples here. So this is the the passage grave at Nauf during its excavation. So Leo would fly around, and these are some infrared photographs he would take on the site. So it's a, these are kind of timeless photographs that obviously record the the process and potentially where the the, the damage has happened on the site. So if any future analysis happens. It, it's uh, recorded, and also he, he would. This is just a, sl a selection from his collection. There's about over six thousand images he, he captured, 
and uh, there's ranges from soil marks, crop marks, uh, topographic features, well, they, co they cover the whole length and breadth of, of Ireland. And then the final bit, I mean, it's kind of moving into the present, is a, an Ogham in 3D, so this is a project uh, run out of the Dublin, Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies in Ireland, and here they've gone around the country and uh, they're recording Ogham stones, so these are the earliest form of uh, script there is in Ireland, so uh, and then there's kind of a domination in the in the west uh, and south of Ireland. So these stones are, it's kind of a, a, a strange alphabet where it's, it's it's constructed out of grooves and, and slashes into the, into a vertical line or the side of the rock. And this project was uh, looking at uh, recording these objects in three dimensions and producing photographs and descriptions of all these objects. So what kind of connects all these different data sets is well the, the first three especially is. All three, guy, all those three people are dead who generated that data, and all those data sets are not available online to anybody. So these are kind of primary record of our monuments uh, within Ireland, but uh, they're not available. And part of the problem is the institutions that have these these uh, antiquity records, they're not fit for, or they're not able to basically make these available through technology. So. You can't support the costs of uh, actually making this stuff online, or there's no proper hard IT infrastructure to allow it online, and there's a, a extreme lack of expertise. So we could, a lot of these places, such as the Royal Society, uh, like, uh, have a volunteer staff, and the volunteer staff kind of age profile would be 50 plus. So you're getting people who who've maybe never even used the internet before. So getting them to scan, produce metadata, and uh, build websites and things like this, it's, it's kind of hard for them to do. So I suppose this is where the, the Low Cloud project comes in. So uh, Low Cloud is an EU project funded under ICT <coughs> Policy Support Programme. And we have, there's 32 partners involved across 28 different countries. And it's building on the success of previous projects such as Europeana Local and Karari Best Practice Network. And the kind of main aim of the project is to make it easier for small, medium institutions, so these individual collections, house museums, things like that, to get this stuff online with good quality metadata, and this, this stuff can then go through to Europeana as an access point. So it's bringing together local history and heritage resources through Europeana, and the locality or the lo local component of it is quite important within here, because if you look at the stuff within Europeana, a lot of it's not locally sourced or generated. So the aim is to get 4 million of these content objects across the whole European region online by the end of the project. i just say we're at this final year of the project at the present. So the kind of technical aims of the project is, a, is within cloud compute, it's going to really like use cloud computing, so the agility, the reduced cost, the scalability uh, for aggregation, enrichment and supply, and it's uh, building on Mint and more, which I'll explain in a minute what they are, but they were created as part of the Karari project. There in, there's an, uh, a concept called low cloud collections, which I'll, I will explain as well. It's about how you give online collections to these kind of uh, uh, house museums and, and small bodies, so they can actually generate their own uh, co content. And it's experiments with alternative ingestion methods for getting the metadata in. And it's primarily it's got to be easily easily used by these people who don't have much technical skills, and it's got to be guidance and training to bring them up to speed on how, how to use this. So this is a kind of breakdown of uh, the workflow within uh, Low Cloud. So if you look over on the left, uh, the, you can get data into Low Cloud under two methods. So one would be if you already have a an online database, or you have a database of uh, images and, and metadata, you can get it get it accessed through it through the OIA PMH, and or you can go through the second method below, which is Omika or the Low Cloud Collections, which I'll explain. So this is where you you want to generate a new online collection. So this data is harvested and ingested using the, uh, the More tool uh, and Mint, and then your <coughs> metadata then is transformed to match uh, the European metadata scheme. And then the kind of most important component within uh, low cloud is this enrichment, and I'll, I'll explain each each different enrichment stage. So this is where the metadata is kind of taken and validated, but it's cleaned up, and it's also enriched with a with a bit of semantics. And then this data is published online for other people to use. 
So the first, the, the Mint tool or, or the mapping and transformation, this allows you to take your metadata and then put, import it into the system and then map it to all the systems that exist. So you can map it to the uh, European, uh, European data model, you can map it to Lido or you can map it to the Carrari. So you're basically taking the terms in your metadata, looking for the equivalent terms in Carrari and then it's, it's mapping it across and it does this uh, validation routines as well. Or you can import CSV files if you don't have a uh, something like Dublin Core metadata already generated. So, so for things, so for the institutes that may know how to use Excel or something like that, and fill in a table with the description data. This is an easy method for them to get the uh, metadata into Europeana. Then there's the the more service within local. So this kind of uh, kind of envelopes all the other services that are within the project. So this tool uh, basically you load in the, your Mint. Uh, metadata which has been uh, transformed and then you can set processes running in this that geocode, enrich your <coughs> metadata, validate it and then pass it on to Europeana for publication. So the, the way they've kind of built it is to be fairly uh, simple for people to use. So within the metadata enrichment there's a this is done for two kind of main reasons. One is the is to provide kind of contextual information <coughs> around each of these heritage objects or or images. Uh, so, and then the second thing is to kind of categorize these objects into a, a more structured uh, form against particular vocabularies that exist or standardized vocabularies. And the metadata enrichment services happen over kind of two different ways. So the first is they happen over kind of a, a background link. So microservices automatically kick in as soon as the metadata is updated and they're kind of looking within the, the description and, and a tile of, of metadata. And they're relating this to things like DBpedia and Wikipedia, so it's, it's hyperlinking automatically. The, peop, the, the person creating the metadata doesn't have to do this. And then there's the more kind of proactive ones where you, the vocabulary matching services where you're initiating the, the service to happen and then yeah, the results come out. So within the micro, uh, low cloud console, people can just get access to these services through this, this basic interface. And you can set these up and chain them and set up a profile of each of these uh, enrichment services to go in. So once you've designed your enrichment service, that's it, it saves and you can just fire data on it, it gets enriched and comes out the other side. So some of the uh, microservices that exist, so there's a geocoding microservice, so this is where institutions don't know about lat long or how to geocode uh, content. It will look down the text of your description and might find a place name. And then it will go to uh, GeoNames and uh, provide coordinates, provide a URI for persistent URI within GeoNames. It'll also normalize the name, so if you maybe misspelled it, it'll, it'll correct that for you. It also does reverse geocoding, so if you put in a coordinate but you don't know the place name, it will generate the place name for you. There's also a historic place name service, so if you're referring in your metadata to, to an example here is Danzig, it would, uh, you know, look down this gazetteer and find the equivalent modern place name, and then geocode that as well. Also within the within your metadata, there's also vocabulary microservices. So these have been uh, constructed in Temetris, which is an open source uh, vocabulary software. And this is here. There's been a, a series of standard thesauri encoded within these microservices that you can reuse. So things like the Getty A and AT. Uh, this period uh, monument classification. There's, there's about 20 different uh, vocabularies that are preloaded into this. That then you can again check against your subject uh, title and description, and it will automatically uh, make relationships to these uh, these uh, thesauri for you. So they're kind of the, uh, the metadata enrichments, and uh, what I'm going to explain now is this idea of the low cloud collection. So. The metadata enrichment would happen after you submitted the data to Low Cloud and it comes out and, and gets enriched and, and published. But they kind of realise that you know not everybody's got a database or you know a spreadsheet that they can submit. So they need to have a tool that's online that provides this complete package for the everyday user to to, to do so. This uh, the Supercomputing Centre in Poznan have uh, produced this uh, called Low Cloud Collections. And this is uh, built on the back of Omeka, which is an uh, open source kind of collection management software. 
that's all he did with Tickle Mika, but kind of rip it up a bit and uh, attach an, uh, extra components to it that made it more suitable for a kind of audience that have very little skills in terms of, of IT trading. So it's kind of dedicated to small memory institutions. So like I say, it's tailored for the, the use of the people who haven't got much experience in terms of IT skills or, or the concepts of things like metadata. It supports multiple collections, so one institution can have you know, 20, 30, several collections on there and they can all manage them within the same uh, kind of reference space. It supports multiple formats, so institutions can put documents, they can put uh, images, audio, video files, all uploaded to Omika and it man handles them and, and, and manages them fine. And it's also got a kind of easy, customizable interface so they can ch the users can pick up, choose from maybe 20 different uh, themes and then they can adjust the colours on those themes and have their own logo and things like this, so it makes it easier for them to construct, uh, you know, and personalise their, their own uh, collection pages. And it provides the kind of local museums with kind of detailed use of statistics, so it's, it's, it's good for them when they go back to maybe potential funders and say, you know, what's the value of doing this? You know, they can easily just get statistics on how many people are actually viewing the content, which collections are more popular than, than others. And it's scalable as well, so uh, if you might start off with maybe 100 images, but then you find it's once you've put all those images in, it's quite easy to grow your collection. So, because it's based on cloud computing and this virtualization, you can continually add space to this. So, this is just kind of a, a screenshot of uh, the low cloud collection. So, it kind of gives you an example, uh, an indication of uh, how many items you have in there, and the number of collections, how many users, what plugins you've, you've got. So, there's a, there's a, there's a huge host of plugins like a mapping plugin that you can just turn on and then it allows you to map your content, things like this. And then they can use like other simple interfaces like where they can give each thing a title, a subject, uh, a description, so it kind of leads them through the whole idea of creating metadata. Or if they want to, they can just upload an Excel sheet if, if they're happy doing that in a bulk ingest. And then once that's uh, published, it, it just produces the publication page then on live on the internet for people so we can, the public can browse your content and uh, just look at the, the, the content and it, it styles it based on, on, on what you requ requested. There's also the, the support and training online for, for this, so there's a dedicated website and there's a dedicated kind of on-call team that you can email and the, the small house museums can get that for 24 or access kind of five days a week in, in terms of uh, support for this. So there's an end user documentation on describing the whole process and they're currently uh, creating YouTube videos to explain people on how to update the data and, uh, and, and create their own collections. But there is kind of uh, issues of sustainability within the project so the European and the EU hasn't provided us with any commitment in terms of future support for these microservices so they've all been produced by six separate institutions so should they be coalesced and one institution looks after them all or uh, should European take ownership of these uh, microservices and, and offer them free to everybody. The cloud hosting at the moment is free so you can go online and I think you get a limited amount maybe two gigabytes of the free space that you can create your collection but moving forwards that they expect the pot on supercomputing just to give this free space to everybody or you know one of the one of the solutions is this to, is to provide a federated so within Ireland I could set up a low cloud collection hub and within France you could do that the same so if I have space on my server I could offer that you know freely for other institutions to use and also the timing of the services like most of these services only became active in November this year or last year so we've got like a year left to uh, kind of get as many people using this content as, as possible but to kind of promote that to the general, to the these small museums and, and to see the kind of full impact analysis of what how people are taking to this and and uh, using it is this is, I don't know if we can do that in the short time. So that's the uh, website address uh, and my email address and uh, if if anybody wants uh, me to kind of show them the collection tools we can, we can do that and there's leaflets here that people can take away and get more information about it. Thanks. Mm-hmm.